Welcome. Everything is demons and everybody was kung fu fighting. You are listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. I'm Jason. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 3, Episode 9, Don't Let the Good Life Pass You By. It was written by Andrew Law, directed by Dean Holland, and it aired November 15th, 2018. Let's get right into it. Doug Forsett goes about his regular routine, reading Peter Singer, gardening, canning radishes, until Michael and Janet show up at his door. They pose as reporters for a chance to speak to the blueprint for all of humanity. Meanwhile, the four humans have some R&R at a nearby saloon. So immediately, you and I were like, it's the lost opening! (laughs) From season two, yeah, Desmond, when we see him in his bunker. And immediately I was like, why do I recognize the back of that person's head? Yeah. Oh, it's because it's Michael McKean. And we just finished um, Better Call Saul. And he was in that. And I loved to hate him as Chuck, Saul's older brother. And this role is kind of similar to Chuck because Doug is living off the grid and uh, and growing his own food and everything. And in Better Call Saul, Chuck had this allergy to electricity, so he had no electricity in his house. And, well, they're both really stubborn, so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So we get our title right away um, from Mama Cass Elliot's track called... Oh, I didn't look up the Don't Let the the Good Life Pass You By. Is that what it's called? That's the title of the song. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So she sings about, you know, watching children grow and having homemade apple pie. Basically, like... Enjoying the simple things in life. Right, which Doug is definitely doing. Totally. 100%. He's not alone eating only radishes and lentils and worrying way too much about snails. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we see, obviously, he's like, he's living on his own land. Um, he's donating food to a food bank. He's logging all of his actions in a book as well. Like he's got this giant ledger where he's just writing down everything that he does during the day and evaluating the actions as, well, are they good enough? Maybe it could improve. Like maybe I need to get better at this. So he's really looking at his life from that lens and that lens only. He's kind of being his own accountant. Yeah. Well, he doesn't have one here, so... Mm -hmm. (laughs) So as I mentioned earlier, Doug is reading Peter Singer's The Most Good You Can Do, How Effective Altruism is Changing Ideas About Living Ethically. So I just want to give a little bit of background on Peter Singer. He's a contemporary Australian moral philosopher. In this book, he's trying to direct our attention to a new movement called Effective Altruism, which is built on the simple but profound idea that living a fully ethical life involves doing the most good that you can do. So it means looking at charities in a really unsentimental way. Like, don't just look at the charities in your hometown. Look at the ones in the world. Evaluate them on how effective they are. Like, how much good they're actually putting out into the world. And then support those charities. Like, look at the bigger picture. Right. And we all know that there are certain charities out there that do not... um, that do not give all of their donations out to people, right? Like maybe a large chunk of their donations end up actually going to administration costs or perhaps their CEO is, you know, giving themselves another bonus this year, right? Right. We all know that there are crummy charities out there. So the idea here is to evaluate the charities that are out there and look for the people that are, look for how much good they're doing out in the world, which usually in Peter Singer's mind is usually how many lives can you save? Mm -hmm. And that's what makes a charity good and effective. Right. I don't like it. Okay. (laughs) Well, it's not that I don't like it. I think it's a great, it's a, it's a great idea and very noble, Mm -hmm. but he, he lists some examples of things that you, you might want to do, but you shouldn't. You should go a different path. Uh, For example, something that he mentioned in one of his TED Talks was uh, there's a blind guy and he you could help him get a a seeing eye dog or you can donate the same amount of money to a third world country to help save 
kids from becoming blind. Mm -hmm. So don't help the one guy who's blind help the hundreds and whatever of those kids. Yeah. Which is great, but now this guy's screwed. (laughs) So basically, he's if you want to donate to your local charities, his idea is don't. Mm-hmm. You should donate to the bigger picture. Yeah, so absolutely. So save the people halfway around the world instead of saving people in your own city. Mm-hmm. Because in his mind, every life is equal. So right. even though you see, like, for example, I work at a shelter and there are many, many people that donate to us and we really appreciate it. But those people tend to donate because we're here. They see mm-hmm, us. They mm-hmm. pass by the shelter. They see maybe the the youth that we hang out. They know them. Something. Right. right? So they feel inclined to donate to them, whereas they might not feel inclined to do that to someone they have never met who's living in a third world country. Mm-hmm. Right? But Peter Singer says that person, that child who's dying of malaria is no less equal than the youth that you might be helping today. Right? right? Like... And because it's so easy to help them, it costs so little money to give, like, the money that would cure their malaria, like, 50 cents or something, Mm -hmm. then why not do it? Because you could do more good. You could save more people, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It just, to me, it's basically says, well, these fewer people locally that could use your help aren't going to get it because we're sending our money to help more people Mm -hmm. somewhere else which is absolutely fantastic it's great but you're still forgetting the few people that you could save here and i think there's a way to just have a balance right Mm -hmm. like donating goods perhaps that you are not using anymore to a local shelter is a good thing to do um but also perhaps giving money to some of these charities that he and uh and other people have researched yeah is also a good thing. So finding a balance, I think, between both is a good idea. Absolutely. I don't think, like the example you gave about the man who would like a seeing eye dog and could really benefit from that, and Mm -hmm. that would improve his quality of life, versus saving hundreds and hundreds of people from ever going blind at all. Right. They both have worth. And it's silly to... Well, not silly, I guess, but I think... That it's not really fair to say that one has no value just because one does more good. Right. To me, it's it's the trolley problem. Right. Okay. So it's saving that one person or saving the five. So it's it's interesting to try and rationalize because at the end of the day, you should really be sending all your money to NASA so they can <laughs> stop a giant meteorite from destroying all the Earth because they can save all of our lives. Yeah, I guess if that's how you're looking at it, right? Well, that's how Singer seems to be looking at it. Yeah, and I think there's plenty to criticize there as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just playing the devil's advocate because it seems really easy to do with his... His very black and white mentality, right? Like the way he presents it. I'm sure that if we had a chance to read the book, which unfortunately I looked in the local library, no copies, very sad. Um... So we watched, you know, some TED Talks and all this, but uh, maybe there's a little bit more to it. But from what we can see, it's pretty black and white. Right. And I think he's a utilitarian like he is. (laughs) It's very similar to Doug's way of life or not just Doug's way of life, but Mm -hmm. the point system. Yes. So it's the parallels. Astounding. And I just couldn't let that one little like shot go by as soon as i saw the book i was like no 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 we gotta pause this i gotta figure out a whole bunch about this oh yeah i'm gonna do so much research anybody reading a book in the show it's it means something yeah and if you are interested if you you know feel that your beliefs align with peter singer's beliefs and you're interested in seeing which charities are doing the most good in the world you should go and check out givewell.org Okay, so back to the uh, actual episode. Um, I feel like it's really interesting. Like, I, l- I really like learning more about Doug. I'm so glad that we got to see him because he really did have this life-altering experience just like the humans. It's just, it wasn't a near-death experience. But it allowed him to understand that his life, that he the way that he was living his life was not good enough. 
right? That he was meant to do more. Um, unfortunately, it's not so much a, I want to put out good into the world. It's, I want to save myself from eternal damnation. Mm -hmm. So. (laughs) And he's very trusting. Like, he's taking this trip, this mushroom trip at complete face value. And like, luckily, we know that it's all true. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't. He's just, he, he's, he thinks it is. Yeah. And that's. And he didn't get it like completely right. No, I don't it was remember. Like ninety-five percent. Yeah, so there's still a little bit there that he doesn't know, which is perhaps why he is living the life that he is living, and not really understanding that his happiness matters too. And well, maybe this is. I mean, I'm jumping ahead here, but Sean does say that he has a feeling that Doug's going to the bad place. So maybe that five percent is going to make all the difference. Yeah, five percent. I don't know. It's a lot. So how do you think this blueprint for humanity works in Michael's mind? What do, What is he thinking? I, we, I know we've discussed like a million times that Michael doesn't have great plans. <laughs> so I'm not expecting it to be some like genius level idea. But like, what is he thinking? <laughs> is he, I, honestly, is he thinking that he can see what Doug's doing, make a, a little guide, like a booklet, mm-hmm. a pamphlet he's going to pass out to every human on Earth and say, this is how you... Get into the good place. Okay, because that works so well, like, on Dundas Square when you see those people yelling at you, like, holding up Bibles and... Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So Michael's going to be one of those crazy people that's like, this is how you get into heaven. Read my pamphlet. It's only got three pages. Read this or you shall be damned. Satan is near. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that's his idea, like... This is a blueprint. We're going to write down everything that he does. We're going to take his little tally sheet and or his ledger. And hopefully people will listen to us. But there are a million... Like, Michael's not an idiot. He knows there are a million different religions out here that are all telling you how to live a good life. And he can't... He doesn't have proof. And maybe he can... Maybe he's thinking he can, like, make proof or show... I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't know whether he's thought that far. Uh-huh. I don't really either because he's saying he wants to figure out what makes Doug tick, but isn't it obvious? Yeah, the Doug's reason... insane. Well, no, but like the reason he does this is because he is so sure that if he doesn't, he's going to go to the bad place. Mm-hmm. So like what makes him tick? Is that just, are we looking for his motivation? Because to me, his motivation was crystal clear. I don't know. It's uh, yeah, you, obviously you like you just... don't. We didn't know what his motivation was necessarily. We didn't even know if he was living a wonderful life mm-hmm. until this episode. So I get that part. Like Michael does just want to see evidence that he's changed and that he is trying to live a good life. Get it? Yeah, because you really need something tangible if you're going to follow this insane idea of these are the things to do to get into heaven. It's very straightforward. There's literally a list of things that you can do. This yeah. will give you enough points. So like... But you can't live your life by a formula. You can't say like, okay, well, this is step one. This and is that's step why two. the system is flawed. Yeah. Because then people will just simply go down the list of how to... What point values are each. And then we'll just try to maximize their points. Yeah. Maximize your points. And then, then you can do enough bad things. <laughs> But yeah. it's still squeak by. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a doozy. It's a doozy of an episode when you think about it, really. I don't know. And that's what it all boils down to. This whole mm. episode is just Michael coming to realization that people can't live like this. Mm-hmm. I mean, he realizes it after Janet does, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think he's just in denial. He's just in denial right. at this point. Because he's worked for the system for so long. He's like, it's got to be, you know, foolproof. Like, it's solid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had my doubts before, but, like, Doug will definitely renew my faith in everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, on a less serious note, there's some really great little moments in this episode. And a couple of the first ones that I noticed was when Doug gives water to Janet and Michael Janet doesn't even try to drink the water. She just, like, holds the glass in this really awkward way. Like, what do I do with this? And I think it's so funny. It's some great, like, background acting from Darcy Carden. Like, 
she knows exactly that Janet's not going to try and drink it. Um, and then we get Chidi, who's super jet lagged and saying like, yeah, I can't even regenerate my core. Yeah, I don't even know what I was trying to say there. Like, and it's so good. It's so funny. He's just making uh, up words. Yeah. I can't even remember what he, like, how do you even say what he says? Redrender my chorf? That's not a, <laughs> anyway. It, it just really caught me off guard. I loved it. That was so funny. The rest of Team Cockroach spends the day in a bar in rural Canada. Jason and Chidi play a game of Jacksonville-style pool while Eleanor and Tahani talk. Janet realizes that Doug has become a happiness pump, trying to maximize happiness at the expense of his own well-being. I think it's really nice to see Chidi relax and hang out with Jason. Yeah, they Um, don't get a lot of together time, like hang out bro time. (laughs) Bro time. Just Chidi and his boys. (laughs) Chidi and the boys. That should be a new band. Michael will be the other boy. Mm, Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I really like it. They don't get to interact that often. Uh, And it's nice to just see them play like this really silly game of pool. And hearing Chidi make up points is so funny. So funny. Like he just. He feels so awkward doing it. (laughs) He says it with like this mix of confusion, but like confidence. And I love it. I think it's so good. Just looking at Jason like 30 million points. (laughs) Oh, it makes me laugh so much. I love it. Chidi's just really fun in this episode. Like he just seems so much more relaxed and it's nice because we always get this really anxious, uptight Chidi. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to see him just like "Eh," shake a little loose, you know? Yep. It's good. And Eleanor getting some nice advice from Tahani. Surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of hope that the rest of the Soul Squad kind of gets the same treatment that Eleanor did. Gets, um their memories maybe maybe not all of them but enough to kind of give them an idea of what life was like in the bad place yeah i hope so too because i know eleanor's the main star of this show but it's nice when everybody else kind of gets to be on the same level Mm -hmm. yeah and jason's game of jacksonville style pool when I was thinking about it, it basically makes as much sense uh, as the afterlife system. When Chidi's like, I either know exactly what I'm doing and it's something, or we're doing nothing and I'm winning. Like, I don't know. It's totally confusing. That's how I feel about this stupid, stupid system. It's like Calvin Ball from Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, yeah. You just make it up. Just make it up. Just we're having fun. That's it. That's all you got to do. And. <laughs> and I thought it was great when you see uh, Chidi just launch the pool ball into the glass of beer. That was good. Yeah, because it didn't shatter and the glass didn't move, which is remarkable. Yeah. Defiance of physics. Yeah. Ball is life. <laughs> um, <laughs> Actually, that moment kind of bothered me a little bit because the beer got on the like grassy part. The felt. Yeah. The felt of the pool table. Grassy part. I know you're laughing at me right now. Shush. <laughs> the felt of the pool table. Break out the lawnmower and just... <laughs> Hold on, guys. We got to pause this game of pool. <laughs> just break out... It's probably a tiny little lawnmower, too. Oh, my goodness. Like a little... Like a single, like... <laughs> like a little, a little toothbrush one. lawnmower yeah. type thing. Okay. So... Oh, maybe it's a shaving system. Like, they have to bring out a little razor and just Ridiculous. spray a little foam on there and just go... Stop. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. But I had a pool table growing up and my dad would like freak out if we put our drinks anywhere near it. It was like, no, 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 no. That felt is so expensive. Getting it changed is so expensive. Don't do it. Meanwhile, there's stacks and stacks of things on it. and Well, yeah, my parents are like nearing hoarder status. So that's a whole thing. But <laughs> yeah, so I like that moment. I thought it was funny. Mm-hmm. Um... So getting back to to Doug and his sad, sad life. (laughs) So sad. He's got 71 adopted dogs and wolves, and that drives me bonkers. Like, what are you doing? I get it that there's strays, but why are you not 
surrendering the dogs to like the nearest no kill shelter like so that you know those dogs will hopefully go to a loving home which will therefore put out more good into the world like and God, these hello. wolves probably have families and the wolves those aren't domesticated animals let them roam let them do their wolf thing yeah doug's goofing yeah he's straight up messing things up and i don't like it and also this whole letting this raymond kid on his bicycle which like buzz off raymond (laughs) uh letting him take advantage of you makes no sense like in the turn in terms of his idea of how the afterlife works how does that actually make sense because sure raymond is gonna be happy that he can boss around doug and be his little sociopath self but if doug continues to make his behavior permissible then raymond is less likely to understand that treating others with kindness and respect is a good thing So he's probably going to go out into the world and cause a bunch of misery to other people because, and I'm not saying it's all on Doug's shoulders, like the kid is awful, but if you let things slide, and I think that's part of parenting too, like not that Doug's his parent, but understanding that there are consequences for your actions and trying to help people understand how to treat other people is a good thing. Like you're doing a good thing to help other people understand that. Right, right. I just think that Doug's doing the world a disservice by letting this Raymond kid boss him around and, you know, do his laundry and all this stuff. No. I think that if that were brought up to Doug, like if you mentioned that, then that would cause some anxiety and he would realize that that's absolutely correct. Yeah, I hope so. Because he's just thinking literally like, do good things for someone, get points. Make someone happy, get points. Yes. Yeah. Make someone happy get points even if what they're asking you to do is completely unreasonable Mm -hmm. and of course that's when janet figures out you know he's just become a happiness pump he's trying to maximize happiness at the expense of his own well-being so it's not like he's thinking in purely utilitarian like uh ways he's obviously got like his whole system mapped out and that may be sort of like utilitarian but not completely because It disregards impartiality, which is included in utilitarianism, which implies that your happiness is equal to anybody else's happiness, and therefore you should not do things that just make you miserable for everybody else, right? Right. But he doesn't Yeah. He doesn't even think that it factors into his point total. And maybe it does. And maybe that's why he's perhaps going to the bad place. I don't know. During this whole scene I couldn't help but think of Chuck because Chuck from Better Call Saul because Michael McKean is just so good at playing these characters that you pity, but you also find really annoying. (laughs) So annoying. (laughs) And that's all I could think of Doug. Like, he was getting on my nerves in this episode. He was peeving me off. Mm -hmm. And he was really, he was doing that for Mike. Like, Michael was getting frustrated and annoyed too. And yeah, Michael McKean did a really good job at making you feel things Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah he evoked a lot of emotion all right moving on eleanor is about to tell chidi they were once in love but they're interrupted by bad place demons walking into the saloon jason tries to use his patented molotov cocktail method but he fails sean is here and he's looking for michael meanwhile doug holds a funeral for a snail he accidentally killed bortles (laughs) nope Nope. Not this time. No, nope, not, not this, this time. time. That moment was kind of like awkwardly choreographed, didn't you find? No? Maybe that's when they grabbed him? Yeah. Yes, yes. It did feel like it wasn't done well. It felt really slow. Yes. And I was kind of like, eh, Jason would have had time to launch that halfway across the saloon. Before he definitely he held him. that over his head a little bit too long. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But I like, uh, again, I love Cheaty and his, you know, being completely jet lagged. And he's like, oh, yeah, we are kind of Bomba John. You know? Like, that <laughs> doesn't even make sense. That's not even a thing. <laughs> nope, no. Nope. But now I just want to say it. You know, I want to be like, oh, that is so Bomba John. Like, just like, that's so Raven. It's because that name just rolls off your tongue so well. And you just, good... you bounce it around and it just feels good saying it. Mm-hmm. Bomba John. Yeah, it's fun. It's like happy and bouncy and it's got good mouth feel, Mm -hmm. which is such a gross word, but is very accurate in this uh, in this case. 
So I don't have a whole lot to say about the humans in this part. It's pretty straightforward, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, not that it's bad, just straightforward. But I have a lot to say about Doug's life because as soon as we got the snail in the picture, all I could think of was Jainism, which oh, is right. an ancient religion from India. So I don't know, you know, an encyclopedia amount's worth of knowledge about Jainism, but you I have a general You did teach a idea. little bit of it. I did. I did. It was years ago, but uh, I'll say a little bit about it. So the essence of Jainism is concern for the welfare of every being in the universe and for the health of the universe itself. So Jains believe that animals and plants, as well as human beings, contain living souls. So that's a big deal, right? They think everything on Earth basically contains a living soul. And they believe that each of these souls is considered of equal value and should be treated with respect and compassion, which we see here with Doug you know, caring a lot, like a great deal about this poor snail that he's killed. And then later after the the funeral, trying to like warn little snails and bugs on the road that he's coming Mm -hmm. um, and trying to donate money to the Canadian Mollusk Association, which by the way, is not a real thing. I looked. (laughs) (laughs) So this idea of nonviolence is one of the main tenets of Jainism. They're strict vegetarians, and they try to live their life in a way that minimizes the use of the world's resources. Um, So, for example, Jane monks don't wear any clothing because clothing is made of fibers and they don't want to have to hurt the plants to get those fibers to get the clothes that they will wear. Right. Um, They could wear rocks. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) No, I don't think so. (laughs) Um. You know, they, they put this cloth over their nose so that they don't, and their mouths, so that they don't accidentally inhale a bug. Man, they're hardcore. Yeah. They sweep the ground before them. They have this very gentle little fan that they sweep the ground before them, before they sit. Right. Um, or as they're walking as well sometimes. And often they die by fasting or starving themselves so as not to cause any more harm to the universe as they ascend. It's insane. So it's it's so interesting, though. It's so, so interesting. Um, there's there's approximately 6 million Janes in the world today. The majority, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. And the majority of them live in India. I'm not saying that each single person that practices Jainism is a monk. They're not all to that extreme level. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to know that there's people out in the world that are living their life um, in order to do, like, the least amount of violence and damage to the world. And it's just interesting thinking, like, okay, Doug thinks he's doing this really great thing, and he thinks that he's getting himself into the good place, but then you have people that are so much more extreme, and then you have other people who are, you know preaching the gospel but like they're on you know they're on like a tv channel and they're they're wealthy people like it's just so there's so many different ideas out there and i find it so interesting and there's people like me you know living a pretty regular life i don't actually believe in any particular god or anything i'm just trying to do good in the way that i see good so i don't know i think it's really cool i just find a lot of this stuff interesting Mm -hmm. um and I thought about I thought about that, too, with the radishes when he says, like, oh, it would be mean to dig up the radishes. Well, they mean, mean, mean to who? The radishes. <laughs> yeah. And he's eating lentils because they have the smallest carbon footprint. Like, there's a reason behind a lot of his behavior, even though it seems really eccentric and kind of nonsensical. Yeah. And I don't think he even realizes a lot of this. He just goes off of this hallucination he had Mm -hmm. he's he's living his life the best that he can because he really believes that he has the right knowledge about the afterlife like he's so devoted right Mm -hmm. um ah. it is it's it's (laughs) fascinating yeah yeah go check seriously go like check out some videos on youtube or something about jainism it's so interesting so cool I was kind of disappointed that the Canadian Mollusk Association is not a real thing. <laughs> Honestly, like when... <laughs> Come on, Canada, get your act together. Those mollusks need representation. I just thought 
thought it was so funny when he's like, oh, their office is in Edmonton. I was like, oh, I gotta look up this place. Is it real? (laughs) $85. He's gonna walk three weeks for $85. Mail it. Or is he like thinking if I mail it, then that means that there are people out there in trucks who are mailing things. And then that's gonna be like, you know, poisoning the environment, blah, blah, blah. So I might as well just walk. Aren't mollusks from like the ocean? Yeah, I thought so. Why would their maybe they maybe why mollusks... would their headquarters be in the middle of our country in like Hicktown nowhere? <laughs> Edmonton is not Hicktown well, nowhere. <laughs> let's let's be honest. Ontario's the uh, oh the... <laughs> wow. I'm our just Canadian... saying that to bug everybody else. I know, our, I know. Our Canadian listeners I'll are going to get real I'll angry. Reel it back. But honestly, Edmonton is not <laughs> right next to the ocean let's no. be honest no it's true it should honestly if it's gonna be anywhere it should be like pei like, or yeah, something yeah yeah exactly it should be on the <laughs> east coast most likely uh yeah <laughs> okay so shall we continue michael advises doug to relax a little but he refuses he can't risk being tortured for eternity michael and janet arrive at the saloon where the demons are holding the humans hostage when Sean threatens to take the humans back, Janet starts a fight. Oh yeah, Janet fighting! <laughs> uh, okay, so Michael, like, we were talking earlier about effective altruism and this idea of, like, doing enough good and then being able to kind of be bad because you, you already got your spot. Right, relax a little. Like, you've been good for so long, just let loose, have a pizza or something. Yeah, which everything that Michael suggests isn't ridiculous it's not like oh relax a little kill a guy whatever it's have some ice cream or some chicken parm like you know and if he if he wants to stay a strict vegetarian or vegan or something go get yourself some vegan donuts those things are great like enjoy your life a little bit find some pleasure in the world Mm -hmm. um and then of course doug just mentions the accountant which we hear about later and got me soups excited yeah, I just said soup's excited. I'm taking after Jason a little bit here. He would say something like that. I would not. Um, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the Jason on the show. Okay. Either that or Cheaty in his jet lagness would be like, yeah, soup's excited. Bama John. <laughs> so we've heard mention about the accountant a couple of times. I believe once, like two episodes ago. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. Did we? We heard a uh, mention once. Right. It was like the Janets are made right next to the accounting department in mm-hmm. the good place, I think. So we're definitely, definitely, like we have to encounter these accountants this season. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a, it's going to be a thing. Oh, I hope so. I so hope so. So were you kind of, were you surprised at Doug that he didn't want to relax a little bit? Like, No, of course no. not. This is like, his misery is his path to the good place. Like, he doesn't care. Because what if he's right? Like, what if that one little point, what if he's one point away from getting in because of that one chicken parm? He would never, like, obviously, he would never forgive himself. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's a life of... Uh, it's misery. I think it would just be so much more torture knowing that you could have done more. Yeah. Uh, and knowing that any pleasure that you gained on Earth led to this damnation. I don't know. Like, it's so intense because he must just be looking at it as, well, okay, I might have like 80 some years on this planet and yeah, they're going to suck. They're going to be miserable and I'm going to hate all of it. But... Then I will get an eternity of joy and happiness and Yeah, honestly, I think yeah. I think anybody would go for eighty years of boring half assed suffering. Cause I mean it's not super suffering, but it's just no, like no. it's just a monotony of Ugh. Just ugh. Well, his life's not great. No, I mean, it's not great. He lives alone. He doesn't have anyone to get close to. It's lonely. Uh, He basically does anything that anyone asks him to do. So he acts kind of like a slave to other people when they show up. It's not like he goes out there and makes himself one. Uh, 
He gathers dogs and wolves that bite him. He only eats radishes and lentils. And from the looks of it, he had like one radish for breakfast and that was it. So like he's not even gorging himself on radishes. He's probably spending like most of his time traveling to places so he can drop off radishes. Like it's not a good life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I'm sure if you asked anybody, they would go through 80 years of this life for an eternity in the good place. Yeah, yeah. I think so. It's just, maybe that's what Michael's hoping, that with proof, the rest of the world would live a miserable life. I don't think that he is, though, because otherwise he'd be like, all right, thanks. Uh, Good job, Doug. Let's go tell everyone that they should live this really, like, awful life, and then they'll get into the good place. Mm -hmm. He's unhappy about it. He doesn't want to see Doug miserable. And I think part of that is just that Michael actually values life a little bit. Like, he values people's time on Earth, so I think it frustrates him and it makes him sad, and I think it makes Janet sad, too, to see that someone doesn't get any enjoyment out of their time on Earth. Right. You know? It's it's, it's a tough thing to watch. So on a less serious note, back at the saloon, um, (laughs) uh, Sean! Sean's here, and I'm so excited to see Sean. I love yeah, him. Yeah, I, I almost forgot that the Soul Squad don't wouldn't recognize him. Yeah, me too. I'm like, oh, right. They don't know who he is, except for Eleanor. Hmm. Well, Eleanor, Eleanor, Eleanor doesn't, doesn't, doesn't know, yeah. yeah. So it's like, oh, right. They just, they don't know him. Mm-hmm. They we have no him. idea they're supposed to be afraid of him. Yeah. They just, she only recognized Bomba John, and then from there probably recognized Vicky, mm-hmm. because in that three-second inoculation flashback, she saw Bomba John and Vicky, mm-hmm. which is now, when I think of it, like a great reason why we had that inoculation part as well, because there's no reason that Michael would show any scenes with the two of them, but to prevent her from, you know, I don't know, combusting into a million pieces or something, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Sean says one of my favorite lines in the episode. He says, "What do you think we're doing, you hemorrhoids?" That is such a good insult. <laughs> it's so good. I don't. It's terrible, but it's so good. Uh <laughs> I didn't say I was perfect, Jason. I never said I was perfect. Fairly certain that's been covered in this podcast. Uh so. Sean says that the humans are legal property of the bad place. And that word legal just, I don't know, that stuck out to me. And I started to wonder if we're going to ever see lawyers one day. Well, we already have the judge. Exactly. And it's like, how did I never think about lawyers in the afterlife before? There's Mm -hmm. a judge. There should be lawyers. There's accountants. There's architects. There's probably like mailmen, janitors, whatever. Well, like Michael, Michael might have been in the mailroom and then upgraded oh. to architect. Ooh, ooh. A little better call Saul action in there, too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, it seems to me that the judge gets to decide on everyone's case arbitrarily. Like, there are no lawyers. It's just her decision is final because she's the oldest. Right. Like, she did say back last season that they didn't have a representative for them. So she wasn't going to be able to look at their case. But then when Michael showed up, he acted as a representative. Mm -hmm. Maybe by the end of the show, Michael's just going to become a lawyer. It's all about his career track. That's it. That's the show. Oh, sure. The bad place demon (laughs) has to be the lawyer. Well, yeah. (laughs) Don't be a lawyer. Don't do it. Quick way to ruin your life. (laughs) Some crazy ex-girlfriend for you. Yeah. That show comes up a lot. So then we get to the fight. Fight, fight, fight. Yep, and then they fight. All right, what happens afterwards? <gasps> you didn't like the fight? <laughs> it was okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. No, it was a lot of fun. Janet and Jason both punch Sean in the throat. Hashtag couple goals, okay? That was a good moment. I mean, Eleanor punches someone too. Yes, she does. She punches Vicky right in the face. Right in the face. Which is nice. She's punching real Eleanor in the face. Mm-hmm. Which I'm sure she wanted to do many times in season one. Oh, yeah. Too bad she won't get the satisfaction if she knew who it was. <laughs> so, how come, you know, you said, like, the fight was great, but you wanted to brush it off? What's that all about, huh? Well, tell me more about that. I don't know. It was, it was good. It was just, I don't know, out of place. I like that about it. It yeah. was shocking. 
you'd never expect a fight scene on the good place. I guess I didn't like how much Janet seemed to be in pain many times. Well, she doesn't have her powers. Does that mean she feels pain? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Huh. Maybe it was not so much pain as it was surprise. Maybe. Okay. Okay. I'm going to headcanon that because I don't <laughs> like this idea of Janet suddenly feels pain. Um, I just, I always find the the cuts between stunt women and their the actor they're portraying, like, mm-hmm. I always find it very jarring. I always found that with Buffy. Like, it was so obvious who this stunt woman was. Oh, yeah. But Buffy was bad for that. Like, real bad. There's this it's... one scene with, like, <laughs> the stunt man who plays Spike in School Hard. Okay, the Spike stunt like, guy and uh, the Angel stunt guy are awful. They're like, terrible. They're, they're like, so, so much beefier than their, oh, the actor uh, counterpart. So it was, yeah, it was just bad. But I didn't notice it too much the, in this The one. movements are just so much more fluid and, like, martial artier. Like, and Janet's is... I mean, Darcy Cardin's just, I don't mean, I, I don't know. It was just, I got, I got nothing. It took you out of it? It took me out of it okay. a little bit, yeah. That's fair. I mean, um, I still liked it. I still thought it was fun. It was just, yeah. There was some good choreo in the fight scene, I thought. Uh, I liked that they actually used the pool table. Like, mm-hmm. Jason uses one of the balls to get the demon off of Janet. And I like when Janet uses that, like, little triangle. Yeah. Um, to like smack that one guy around. That was fun. And Tahani fencing. Yes. Smacking the guy over the head. Yes, that was so good and so in character for Tahani. It was perfect. Yeah, of course um, she took fencing. Of course. It's a rich people sport. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and even though Eleanor doesn't get a whole lot of fight time, um, Kristen Bell did a really good job when Chidi is being dragged mm-hmm, away. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She looked terrified. Like, there's this two second clip of her and she just has these like tears in her eyes and she's just. This person I'm about to confess my love to. Yeah. This person that I've just realized I love is about to be taken away from me. And that's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. Um, and Chidi doesn't participate at all in the fight. No. Nope. Which makes perfect sense. I think he's a pacifist. Yeah. <laughs> Nonviolence for Chidi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't really, the part that bugged me the most was the like awkward exposition of Janet being pushed into the door a little bit. And then she's like, oh, even if I'm only a little bit in the afterlife, I get all of my powers back. Audience, what do you think about? Like it just, oh, it was so not good. Mm -hmm. I didn't care for it at all. I just thought it was so awkward. Like it would have been so much better, I think. If Janet had been, like, pushed in a bit, and then her powers just happened, and she was like, oh, I got him back! And then we could have figured that out, like, we didn't need a whole little, uh, nah, yeah. just don't do or that. Or she could have told them afterwards, like, if someone mentioned, like, what happened, like, you turned the fight around, what, I don't know, just anything that wasn't completely like that. It, I don't know. Yeah, it just, really... Maybe just a look on her face, like... A sudden realization, like getting wide-eyed all of a sudden, or like a smile coming over, or you know, anything. Yeah, we would have been able to infer you didn't need to like look directly at us, like it was an after-school special, and, and then tell us, you know. <laughs> no thanks for that. I mean, we're already we're, we're not dumb audience. Like this is a, a smarty a smarty pants show. Oh, the smarty pants yeah, show. You gotta Are you be kind of smarty pants. Gotta Jesus? be kind of hoity-toity in the in the know. <laughs> Wow, that was so Tahani of you. What can I <laughs> say? The We've all got show. a little Tahani in us. <laughs> we all wish we did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on. Last uh, last little bit of the episode. Okay. Eleanor confesses her feelings to Chidi during the brawl, and Janet takes care of all the demons except one, Sean. He says Michael is only delaying the inevitable. All the humans, even Doug, will go to the bad place. Michael hatches a plan to go to the afterlife accountant's office when more demons show up. Janet decides to take all the humans into her void. And that's not a euphemism. No. <laughs> Gross. Um, <laughs> so, Eleanor and Chidi, very cute. Nice little moment. I love that Eleanor just kept, like, emphasizing, like, me, right now, here, 
on this plane of existence, in this bar, in Canada, during this brawl. Like, she just, she kept going, and it was such, like, an awkward Because you little... know she's feeling kind of awkward because <sighs> she's just confessed her feelings, so she's, like, just keeps rambling. <laughs> I thought it was so cute. I loved it. And this is the second time she's admitted her feelings to Chidi. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I kind of like it better than last season's, in a way. Because last season, it was, like, this awkward moment, and then... There was the heartbreak of seeing Chidi watch this video and then still tell her, I don't think I feel that way about you. And this one was just kind of like, uh, well, we could die. So let I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to be honest with you. And I love it. I think it's great. She didn't hold this secret in for months and months, mm-hmm. right? It's, it shows some kind of some growth, I think. Um, Even better than last season. And I feel like Sean is hinting in this scene that either the good place doesn't exist at all, which is like a theory that everybody has, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or it's just super, super hard to get into that virtually nobody does. What if it's being taken over? What if it's being held hostage? Oh, like the bad place infiltrated or something? Or the demons are keeping people from getting in there because they've got them held captive or prisoner or the people who run the good place are are trapped somewhere because the demons have need more people to torture because they're getting bored or whatever so so there's nobody getting into the good place right now because they can't they're being redirected hmm Ooh, i like that oh i'm just i'm so excited um everything michael was saying in this whole scene just made me so so happy uh i just really glad to go back to like uncovering more about the afterlife system and trying to challenge it i just that's what i i love about this show like i love all of that the afterlife so then like getting back to it is just so exciting for and the me. mechanics and how it all works yeah. and the bureaucracy and the <laughs> levels of you know i love fighting the man the man being the system. Yeah. Um, and it's a good point. Like, if the system is so broken, nothing the Soul Squad does on Earth is going to help. So, really, you got to fix from the inside. Yeah. You can't just keep spinning your wheels on Earth hoping that things will change. And I think that's Sean's whole plan is that he knows the system's broken because maybe he's helped participate in breaking it and he's trying to keep michael from fixing it yeah he's using this broken system to his advantage Mm -hmm. for sure but we know this show has a few more seasons up its sleeve (laughs) so we can't have any resolution this year no no it's not like a oh all of a sudden the system isn't completely overhauled in like three episodes that's not gonna happen Mm -hmm. um and everything changes on a dime right at the end of this episode too like we think okay the plan is going to the afterlife gonna go to the accountants well michael and janet are and then the four humans are gonna stay here on earth but suddenly all of a sudden we're going to janet's void and that's and a whole uncharted territory <laughs> hopefully that means we get to see Derek again oh yeah i forgot about Derek. Mm-hmm. well i want to see him <laughs> yeah because the next yeah. episode is called janet's mm-hmm. so we'll see what that means So Janet says that all the humans are most certainly going to die when she takes them into the void. But wouldn't passing through the door to the afterlife also do that? Like, is that why Michael said, don't come with us? Like, just stay at Doug's place and take care of his radishes and his snails? Like, is that why Michael didn't want them to come along? Because they would most certainly die? Could it be because this rebooted universe is going to collapse as soon as... Oh, I don't know. I didn't think about that. I just figured it was like, you can't be alive on Earth, but also be in the afterlife at the same time. Like, you can't do both. Why would they be in the afterlife and the Earth at the same time? Because if they decide... No, but, like, you can't... I don't know. You just just can't travel through that without death. Travel through what? The door to the afterlife. You can't go into the afterlife without dying. So Janet's void is kind of like part of the afterlife, I guess. She only got those powers back. But like, 
it's weird. Like she can conjure this void here on earth because she has her powers back after going through the door a little bit. It was kind of a confusing moment a little bit. Mm. Cause like, okay, we're just, we're dead now. So I'm assuming that means we're done with earth. Yeah. I'm assuming we're done with earth as well. Um, but my take on it was there's no need for this alternate universe now, like this multiverse. Mm-hmm. So it's going to cease to exist. Oh, what would happen to all the demons? Would they die? Which would then just I think that would be the next. The I would think that would be their next step is they would shut down this, this, this part of the multiverse. Mm. Close the door to this chapter. Right. Kind of like the show. The, kind of like the show is potentially closing the door to this chapter of Earth. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So I want to go back to effective altruism. Now that we're at the end of the episode, this episode is kind of a criticism of effective altruism in a way, because here we have Doug, who's a man who's trying to do his best to promote happiness and reduce harm, but who ultimately is going to fail because the system isn't built for him to succeed. And one of the common uh, criticisms of effective youth altruism and that is that it's so focused on the individual and what you can do and what we can do but it's not focused on the systems that are in place that are causing so much misery for these people like these countries that don't have the resources like the government resources the the money the the people to actually sustain a a certain population right like it's it's interesting because here we have this system that's so, so broken. And here on Earth, we have a system that's so, so broken. And all these little individual things that we're trying to do, I'm not saying that they don't have impact, but it's like... It's not fixing the main problem. It's treating the symptom not of the problem. The, yeah, okay. Instead of the root of it. And I see that. Like, I see little hints of it here in this episode talking about the system of the afterlife being broken, seeing that Doug, even in his good intentions, is still... Doug is still going to end up in the bad place because structural change needs to happen for actual, like, real progress to be made, I think. And I don't... I'm not here to say that, like, whatever anybody does in their life, donating, volunteering their time is worthless. Like, absolutely not what I'm saying at all. I just think we need to be looking at it from both sides. Like, people on Earth need to do better in Michael's eyes, but also the system of the afterlife has to be able to acknowledge that people can change and that people are doing good and has to be less unsympathetic, I think. So I see a little bit of the show doing that, and I like it. (laughs) I like it a lot. So. (laughs) Uh, And then we did have... A question last week, and we didn't really answer it that well because we hadn't done a whole lot of research on effective altruism. Um, but Sierra at Cal is Strange asked, What you were saying about someone with a hundred sandwiches versus one sandwich reminds me of something that was said about effective altruism, which is if Michael Zuckerberg gave away one billion dollars, he still has 30 billion. So we should view him as someone with 30 billion who gave away nothing. Um, which is kind of like what Peter Singer was saying as far as, um, like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, like, yeah, they're billionaires, but they're giving a whole lot of their money. Right. And he himself gives a third of his income to charity. Right. So in his eyes, it's like, if you're not giving, if you're still living this like luxurious lifestyle, um, and you're giving, yes, some of your money away, even if it's a billion dollars, like. A billion dollars is nothing to Mark Zuckerberg, right? If you have 30 billion, you can live the most lavish lifestyle you want. Sorry, Mark Zuckerberg. I'm getting confused with the M names. And then, of course, Doug accidentally calling Michael Mark in this episode doesn't help. Um, So then Sierra goes on to say, Obviously, if you take that attitude to the extreme, you could say that any purchase above the bare necessities is you actively choosing not to feed someone or house someone. Or, you know, potentially cure someone of malaria or whatever. I don't know if I agree with that, but I think our Western capitalist world could use a lot more of the effective altruistic attitude. 
especially in our taxation policies. Do you think the good place has an effective altruism mindset? You said earlier you don't really like effective altruism. Do you feel like the world should be more like that, though? Even if you don't care for maybe Peter Singer as a person or the way he presents his ideas? I don't know. I guess I think maybe it seems selfish, but I prefer the idea of helping your community first. But the thing is, our community here in Canada, like, we don't live in uh, in the U.S., but Kingston itself is a fairly well-off community. Like, we're doing pretty good, right? And mm-hmm. most of the people in our community are not dying of extreme poverty. They're right. not dying of malaria. But we still have problems. Yeah, I'm not, to, I'm so not the, saying we don't. doesn't that mean that our problems would be easier and quicker to solve? Then we can move on to the next problem. But... Isn't it easy to be able to give some of your money to these charities that are known to, like, extend your dollar and save millions of lives? Absolutely. It certainly is easy. How but is it's that also, not easy? It is. I'm okay. not saying it's not. I'm just saying that I like the idea of helping the where you live, like making your own, the place where you spend all your time, making it better. Making it better... For your community so that you can see the effort of your, like, the the result of your actions? Because your community, where you live, your city has done so much to make it a place that you want to stay. Obviously, otherwise you would try to leave. Hmm. So, make it better. Isn't that kind of like a, a bit of a, like, nationalist view of looking at it, though? Like... I'm going to help my people and only my people and screw everybody else on the planet. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to help others because, well, I don't have to see you and I don't live there next to you. So I don't have to listen to you dying in a hut next to me. It's not that I don't want (laughs) to save others. It's I want to save people that are or I want to help people that are closer. Mm. I don't don't know. It just it's people like to see the impact of their charity. Mm -hmm. You like to know that. The money you gave to a homeless shelter is helping the people that are homeless and Mm -hmm. giving them a place to stay and getting them jobs. Yeah. You see less homeless people on the streets. Great. Mm -hmm. And you know your community is is thriving. Yeah, your community is benefiting from your donations and your charities. I guess I see, like I said earlier, like doing both. I feel like more needs to be given to people that I don't get to see every day and that don't have the advantages of someone who was born in Canada, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's all luck of the draw. Like, none of us decided we were going to be born where we were born or to the family that we were born to or with the body and life that we were born into. So I think, I don't know about the good place having an effective altruist mindset. Um, I feel like... I feel like they're they're trying to make some like systemic changes like Michael is for sure and I think they're acknowledging that you should do good on earth and you shouldn't do it to make yourself feel better or for recognition like we see with Tahani but like you should just do it because it should be done like because it is morally good to do and not for moral desert right which is like part of what peter singer just argues for like you should do it because you can and because you should like there's no reason you shouldn't i i guess what i don't like about singer's ideas is what i mentioned earlier is that he's basically saying don't help people closer to you when you can help people farther away for cheaper Mm -hmm. and i just help more people with the same amount of money i think is what he's arguing yeah yeah I guess I just don't like that. Mm -hmm. And I think we just need to find a balance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I I do agree with you. Um, with you, Sierra, when you're saying our Western capitalist world could use a lot more of this effective altruistic attitude. I think so as well. I see a lot of people that have an excess of wealth and that are not really contributing to their society or to the the world um and especially not to like global poverty yeah i think we could all 
stand to be more empathetic for sure. Um, as far as the good place goes, I don't know. What do you think? Listeners, let me, let me know. Let us know. Okay. And on that note, I think we should get to the other things in our mailbag. But But you you gotta gotta make your own kind of mail. Write your own special thoughts. Make your own kind of mail. Even if nobody else reads along. We're reading along. Don't worry. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, Mama Cass. <laughs> At 32 years old, I'm sure you're rolling around in your grave. 32 years old? She died at 32. Aww. Heart Poor failure. Mama Cass. She's a good singer. Uh, so not, not exactly male, but quite a few people weighed in on the topic of penguin as pets because last episode I had that issue with Jason getting a penguin as a pet and it seeming to have no torture. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently... They poop everywhere. Like they're loud. Everywhere. And they're super noisy. So I guess they're not an ideal pet. Uh, thanks for the info. Didn't realize they were terrible in certain ways. They seem lovely. A lot they of really people do. know a lot about penguins. Yeah. What's up with that? Why do you know so much Got about a lot of penguin pros penguins. on our Twitter? <laughs> penguin pros? Yep. I love it. A lot of penguin pros <laughs> popping up. Uh, okay. So our first piece of mail comes from Alan at Chipper Allen. He said, most religions don't have an all-powerful God, and so they sidestep the theological problem of determinism. The Greeks and Romans compartmentalized it with the fates. Norse religion was about determinism. Odin was motivated by avoiding his death in Ragnarok, which caused it. So, yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Like, I think because we're just not religious, uh, the two of us have some learning to do as far as that goes. Um, <laughs> ignorance is bliss <laughs> um, not true not true um, I, no because like... it'll get us into the bad place oh goodness how do you know well if the good place and the bad place exist then we're definitely going to the bad place <laughs> okay so you're just cool with that meh meh okay <laughs> um, I like this though I like I don't really know a whole lot about religion it's um, it eludes me I suppose I should say. Um, So I like that uh, Alan's kind of bringing us back. Like, there's a lot of religions out there that don't have an all-powerful God. Or, you know, maybe they are completely about fate. And that's an issue as well. Like, Mm -hmm. we tend to speak from a very Christian perspective. And from a perspective of people who aren't actually Christian. I think that comes from this show. Yeah. Which is like a heaven and a hell. Yeah. So it's... That kind of likes to, like, touch very lightly on other religions, but not make this show about religion. Right. So I think it would be really interesting to have uh, the perspective of someone who knew more about religion to talk to us. So, uh, I don't know. Hit us up. Tell us more. Thank you, Alan. Our last piece of mail comes from Paul at That Paul Moffat. On the topic of determinism, we don't have to imagine that Eleanor or Michael's actions are determined. They are. 100%. By Michael Schur. But their actions still have meaning, which is why we want to watch them. Her, her, her. <laughs> no, I love it. I think it's great. Um, it's it's such a great like meta reading of it, right? Everything is determined. I think it's funny. It's it's a good thing. Thank you for pointing that out, Paul. <laughs> that made me laugh. It's like watching the Truman show and then having Truman and like Truman anxiety in your real life. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's if he's having this conversation with one of his friends about determinism, and you're like, oh, that's awkward. <laughs> what if it was determined that we would have this talk conversation about determinism? That's weird. Yeah, crisis mode. Da-na-na-na-na-na. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. So the good place will return with new episodes next Thursday, December sixth. Um, Yes, they did take a little bit of a break for Thanksgiving. Not a huge one, though. So the end of the season is coming along. And as Jason mentioned, our next episode is called Janet's. And I'm really excited to see Janet's Void and maybe get some more information on all the Janet's. Maybe the creator of Janet's. Who knows? Like, there's a limitless void of information that we could get. You know, like Maybe it'll be the ultimate. Yeah, that was that was great. That's good, yeah, huh? Maybe it'll be the <laughs> ultimate bottle episode. It'll just be Ooh. white. Oh man, we just, just have to act in front of a green screen yeah, the entire the entire episode. time. Uh, 
That brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. Like, it's hard to find. Like, you have to go snooping for it. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. Tag your thoughts with the hashtag FBullshirt. We're also on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can email us directly from our website, multiverseradio.ca. Because we're Canadian. A. So obviously next week we're not going to have an episode because we will be watching the new episode of The Good Place. So expect a next episode of Fork and Bullshit in a couple weeks. We'll see you then. Oh, and until then, grab yourself a frothy pint of Molson at the Puke and Moose and donate to some charities. The Mollusk Association. Yeah, the Canadian Mollusk Association. There are no other good charities out there. That's the only good one. It's the only one that matters. <laughs> Come save the snails. Bye. Bye. But if Doug continues to make his brave words, I can't say bra- behavior. Right? Is he wearing behavior. Behavior. I'm trying to say behavior, but it's like when I say rural, and I can't say rural. <laughs> Without sounding like you're having like a stroke. I know. I was trying to say it. Can you say rural? Rural. Yeah, but like the way I say it sounds like the U is like rural. 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 <laughs> rural. <laughs> I have such it's like a you're hard saying R U A L. Rural. I can't say the word rural. It doesn't work in my mouth. I can't make those m- movements. I can't make those mouth movements. That's not pizzazz. You gotta try again. Hey, that brings us to the end of (laughs) Fork and Bullshit, a multiverse radio production. If you like the show, you know what to do. Slam that like button, mash that subscribe (laughs) button, and we'll see you next week. Don't forget to hit up the comments and let us know what you think. Check us out on social meds, by the way. (laughs) It's SoCal meds. (laughs) Try again.